Gorgeous, gorgeous girls read books about love, even though no one loves them. <laughs> it's me, I'm Gorgeous Gorgeous Girls. It feels like love is in the air right now, and I'm wearing my damn face mask. Valentine's Day just happened, I'm heading to Paris in a couple of days, the city of love, and I've never been so single. <laughs> So, instead, we are going to warm my icy, unloved heart with some romance books. And because I'm unhinged, <laughs> we're gonna read seven in seven days. This Valentine's Day, I'm both unhinged and on hinge. Nice. But before we bumble our way through the books, that's right, the dating app jokes will keep coming. I also wanted to talk a little bit about my foray into the romance genre um, before we put more Tinder on the fire. I'm here all week. I wanted to touch on the fact that I'm so conscious that I'm doing this challenge as a man. And there is a general trend of men shitting on things that generally women enjoy. Whether that's boy bands, certain TV shows, romance books. It reeks of misogyny when these things are dismissed as frivolous or silly, unnecessary, low brow, unsophisticated. And it is so, so important to me to make sure and also clarify that I am not here to add to that noise. I want to make it abundantly clear right now that I love reading, I love books, I love literature, I love having fun with tropes and conventions. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm not here to say that romance is unnecessary at all, because it absolutely is necessary. It's such an important genre. People get so much joy from these types of books, and that makes it important, as well as all of the incredible writing that exists within this genre. I guess I wanted to add this disclaimer right from the beginning, because I know that a lot of romance lovers can go into defense mode when they feel that someone is targeting a genre that they really enjoy, especially a male. And it's understandable, you know, if you've been kicked before, of course you'll flinch next time someone, you know, draws back their foot. What I wanted to say is that I'm on your side here. I'm here to read the most popular romance books and see what I think of them and just have a bit of fun. So I hope that comes across in this video. I'm feeling very open-minded. I want to try some new things with my reading. And speaking of which, loads of you guys always comment saying that you want to expand your reading and diversify the books that you have on your shelves. And so to do this, I've teamed up with Microsoft To Do, who have very, very kindly sponsored today's video. Microsoft To Do is a cloud-based task management website and mobile app. You can create a smart daily planner and easily share it with friends, family, or colleagues. You can break tasks down into simple steps, add due dates, and set reminders to keep you on track. And I actually had the really amazing opportunity to work with the developers at Microsoft to give them feedback on early versions of Microsoft To Do. Such a cool opportunity. And so, using this really cool software, I have created my 2022 reading challenge, which I'd love for you to participate in. And I'm using the share feature to share with all of you so you can do the challenge alongside me. I'm going to be doing it as well. The idea behind this is to diversify your reading list. So I've set different goals for the year to tick off. So the challenges include reading a book that has been translated into your native language and also reading a book from someone from a different continent to you. So the link to check that out will be down below in the description box and I'd love you to send me a screenshot when you've completed it as well as the books that you read to get to that point. That'd be so cool at the end of the year and something we can kind of do as a community. And also Microsoft would love to hear your thoughts on the program. They're doing paid focus group sessions and you can register your interest again down below. So go check it out. I'm super excited by Microsoft To Do and I hope you are too. And now let's go read some romance books. Seven days in June. <laughs> Hello you. You want to tell the people about some good fiction? No? Okay. Yeah, you just make yourself comfortable, okay? <laughs> Seven Days in June is the first book that I wanted to talk about. This is actually a reread for me because I loved the audiobook so much that I bought a physical copy and I just finished reading it. And this is a black love story. And some people ask me, you know, why do you draw attention to the fact that it is specifically a black love story or a queer love story? Whether that's necessary or whether it draws attention to them as an other. For me though, I think that if you want to find a cis white straight romance, there's an abundance of those. It's not going to be difficult. You're not going to have to look very far. Bookshops are literally overflowing with those. But when groups are underrepresented in certain industries or certain genres, I think it's pretty important to A, shout your praises a little bit extra loud, and B, signpost those books so that people who are struggling to find people that they recognize in the books that they're reading can be pointed in the right direction. Representation is so important. And if that's something you've never had to think about, then lucky you. The more people who find these books, buy these books, love these books, sends a message to the publishing industry that, hey, there's a market for this. It means a wider range of authors get book deals and opportunities. And it comes full circle because it means that you get a greater choice of books to read and you get to learn from a wide range of other people's experiences that you may not have heard otherwise. So it's a win-win. And while these books are still underrated and underrepresented, I will continue to draw attention to them as much as I can and champion non-white, non-straight, non-cisgendered pieces of art and 
This is a great example. Seven Days in June is about two authors who unexpectedly reunite, and they realize that in the years of their long separation, they have been each other's muses that whole time. I was Josh Safdie's muse when he wrote on Kaja. Right. The echoes of their relationship reverberate through everything that they write. And so this is a kind of enemies to lovers, but so believable. I recently read another romance called Love Again, and in that book, they were like enemies, but there was no obvious reason why. And it really annoyed me because it relied on you just believing the trope. Rather other than actually establishing the fundamental foundations of the tension that the whole book completely relies on to have some sort of pace. It was very much taken for granted that the fact that the author had said they were enemies meant that we as the reader would just <laughs> sort of go along with it. This book does the complete opposite of that. The raw emotion is so convincing and I enjoyed the process of slowly unraveling these two characters and also their complex history. It's a really special book. It's also about the publishing industry so it's a book for book lovers and it also has some fascinating observations about fandoms, about sexist and snobby attitudes to certain types of literature, kind of like what I was talking about the beginning of this video and honestly we've started off with an absolute banger this is a corker i love this book so we're off to a flying start and the next book is quite literally flying us to spain the spanish love deception this has got to be the most confused i've ever been about a book having so much hype maybe we got lost in translation maybe i asked for too much this thing was not a masterpiece <laughs> and i will tear it all up in my humble opinion <laughs> This is dog shit. So we basically have these two office workers, enemies to lovers, fake romance vibes. The girl has got to attend her sister's wedding in Spain, and the office worker who supposedly hates her offers to come along with her in line one of the book. That is literally the opening line of the book. So from the very opening, we know exactly what's gonna happen. It is so predictable. I've had more tension with my morning granola and the characters don't redeem it. They are completely one dimensional. The reason they supposedly hate each other is kind of pretty naff. And the male love interest in this book is just a personality vacuum. They could have replaced him with a blow up doll and it genuinely wouldn't have made a difference <laughs> to this story. Even the author was struggling to describe this man in an interesting way. I think she must have used the term ocean eyes at least 25 times. You could have Billie Eilish on loop all day and you wouldn't hear ocean eyes as many times as in like one chapter of this book. She only had two ways to describe this man. One was the ocean eyes, I'd rather drown than read that again. Or the fact that he's just big. He is a big, tall, huge, enormous man. And apparently that's enough. And then we have a narrator who also doesn't have a single defining feature. So essentially for just short of 500 pages, we're just following these two characters who are conventionally attractive and that's it. And the plot is so obvious, they end up going to Spain, they fall in love. The bloke gets a five day Duolingo streak and suddenly she's like, is this the love of my life? My man listened to Camille Cabello say, I love it when you call me senorita and said, challenge accepted. He was taking notes. I wasn't rooting for either of them. Their romance felt as real as a Love Island romance. And it truly felt like the author had her Microsoft to do open and was just ticking off a checklist of romance tropes. They were just being chucked in at random, especially at the end. And there's just no substance at all. Honestly, I was hoping this book would give me a paper cut just so I could feel something. I hated this. So hopefully the only way is up from here. Okay, The Hating Game. This actually follows quite similar tropes to The Spanish Love Deception, except it does them well. We have the office romance, enemies to lovers, but in this book, it makes sense why these characters actually have a rivalry in the first place, because they're both competing for the same job promotion. They each initially worked for a separate company, but those two companies merged, and so now they share an office. The male love interest is still defined as just being big and tall and huge. And then we're also constantly reminded how teeny tiny and little the female character is. I'm not sure. Maybe the author's intended audience was goldfish. And that's why we have to be reminded every three seconds how teeny tiny and small she is. And maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about the representation of male bodies in the romance genre because it's limited. Every love interest has a rippling six pack. They look like an Adonis. They're impossibly handsome. Where's the representation for the average boys? <laughs> Where is that? A little bit of respect for the five out of tens, okay? <laughs> I suppose you can make quite a strong argument that the main character is meant to feel lust towards the love interest. But just one of these days, I'd like to be like, he had a dad bod. It was okay. His eye bags look like they'd been bought in Ikea, but it shows some dedication to whatever he's doing. You know, a moment of silence for the forgotten average boys of the romance genre. <laughs> Back to this book though. My favorite thing about this book is that the girl has a smurf collection sure why not and it wasn't a major plot point of the book it was just sort of to make her more quirky but it really piqued my interest i, I want a whole book just about this smurf collection i'm left with more questions than answers <laughs> about the smurf collection is the main character a little bit cringy 
Yes. Does she regularly say things that most of us would probably filter out? Also, yes. I do feel like the book is incredibly silly at times, but it's done intentionally. The book doesn't take itself too seriously, and I enjoyed that element of it. This was such a solid 3.5 stars out of 5 for me. It was just lighthearted and enjoyable. It's not groundbreaking necessarily, but it wasn't trying to be. I do wish there had been more developed subplots, specifically the Smurf collection. In the second part of the book, there is a lot of sex sort of described thrust by thrust. <laughs> and I don't know if we needed that level of detail. I don't know, I feel like we could have been more resourceful here. Like if we cut some of the detail about the sex, maybe we could have had more about the Smurf collection. I don't know. So no hating game, but not a loving game either. Very average, much like the people who are not represented in this genre. And so next time I see you, I'm actually going to be in Paris because I'm heading there tomorrow. I'm getting the Eurostar, which is a train that goes between London and Paris. And so I'm going to read a book, which mostly, as far as I know, takes place on a train. So see you then. Let's go. Okay, we have made it to Paris, and I just finished this book. This is One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. After reading Red, White and Royal Blue, this was not what I expected at all, because it kind of has an element of light fantasy, but I really, really loved it. One Last Stop is just a hug in a book, truly. It's a sapphic love story primarily, but it's also about friendship. And we have this brilliant cast of peripheral supporting characters. It feels like you're being invited in to this really heartwarming, and wholesome dynamic that they have. And it's a community of people who are just bursting at the seams with love for one another. So I really enjoyed this spin on romance where we have, yes, a romantic love story, but also platonic love, which is often just as intense and as powerful a force. So the story is we follow a girl who has just moved to New York City. And this is very relatable. She gets on the subway and just falls in love with this girl. I feel like we've all had that moment on a train where we just fall in love with a stranger. But she follows through. They end up meeting on the subway a lot of times, but it's not that simple. Dun dun dun! Because the girl on the subway can't leave the subway. She was actually frozen in time back in the 1970s, and she's been stuck on the train carriage ever since. She hasn't aged a day in that time, and initially she can't actually remember how she got into this predicament in the first place. Our protagonist sets out to find out why that might be, and the story kind of kickstarts from there. It's an incredibly vibrant book with wonderful characters, great drag representation, cracking, albeit very unusual premise, and a brilliant range of New York settings as well. We have the subway, we have a house share apartment in, you know, a questionable building. Um, I felt like this really captured the feeling of living with your best friends. And although this definitely feels more mature than Red, White and Royal Blue, I love that Casey McQuiston is creating this catalogue of books which just present and celebrate pure queer love and queer joy. I definitely think a lot of people will find comfort characters in this book and I'm so intrigued to see what Casey McQuiston does next because they are so talented. And just to note that their pronouns are they, them. So if you want to discuss this book in the comment section, make sure you use the correct pronouns. And now, on to our next stop. Hmm, I didn't love this. I did not love Honey Girl as much as I was expecting to. This is a book about a girl who wakes up one morning in Las Vegas with a hazy memory of the night before and a wedding ring on her finger. Up until now, throughout her life, she has always followed the rules, especially because she has a very strict military father who is a barbarian, to be honest. Before now, the main way that she has sort of subverted her father's expectations is when she decided to study astronomy rather than becoming a doctor. And then she marries a stranger, so pretty rogue from her. The main problem I had with this book is that we're introduced to a plethora of characters and none of them are developed. She has all these random friends, and I think at least two of them could easily have just been written out of this book. It would have been better to have two side characters with loads of depth rather than five with none. In fact, nothing was really developed enough at all. Like, if you're gonna write a character with a freaking PhD in astronomy, surely you should use loads of space metaphors and allusions to help the character express herself, because that's the thing she knows more than anything. But the author <laughs> didn't know anything about space. I just felt like she didn't do enough research, which is kind of ironic when you're writing a character who's dedicated their life to research. I needed more space in the novel, because at this stage I just need space from the novel. I just thought the whole thing was quite unconvincing, especially because characters and whole plot lines would just be randomly dropped for like <laughs> a third of the book. It was sort of about her marriage to this random girl, it was sort of about her family's expectations of her, it was sort of about her personal career struggles, but it spread itself way too thin. It tried to do too much at once, 
and did nothing. So, honey, I will not be recommending you. I'm very sad about this. Okay, this book, this is how you do it. This is how you write a steamy romance that still has substance and gives the characters some shred of personality. Thank you. This is perfect escapism, light and fluffy like a good cake. And you know what? It's delicious. My compliments to the chef. I thought this was a brilliant romance. The stakes are literally so low that it's vegan, but I don't mind because the characters were people I could really get behind and I was really rooting for. So firstly, we have Stella, who is an econometrician whatever the hell that means, and she is navigating romantic life with autism, which means that she really struggles with physical intimacy. To combat this, she hires an escort called Michael to help her get some... sex experience, shall we say. He has sworn he'll never fall in love with a client, so... Guess what happens? The process of watching these two characters open up to each other and break down their personal barriers was so damn sweet and endearing, it melted my icy heart. And it does really build up to its climax. Careful. Careful. It builds up to that moment. Climax was a poor choice of word, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. It builds up to that moment very well, that's what I was trying to say. Men, on the whole, are trash, and they've just treated Stella really, really badly. So her expectations for men are pretty low, like the bar is on the floor. And yet some of these men still manage to limbo under it. Luckily, on the whole, Michael is a pretty good guy, and one thing I thought was really interesting here, that I haven't really seen discussed much in the romance genre, was the theme of consent. And I know that in a steamy romance, maybe that seems like a bit of an oxymoron, but actually, it doesn't subtract at all from the romance and the connection that they have. It actually adds to it and intensifies the emotions that they feel for each other because there is that fundamental layer of trust. Aaron from the Spanish Love Deception should be taking notes. He should be writing a thesis on this. But anyway, overall, it was really cool to see lots of gender reversals within the confines of the book. The woman in the relationship is the moneymaker. The man is more of a creative. In fact, the whole novel is kind of a reversal of Pretty Woman. <laughs> Maybe that's a hot take, but I think I think that makes sense. I think it's really, really refreshing to see a romance novel subvert so many conventions while still operating within a lot of classic tropes. So, can confirm I would give the kiss quotient a big fat kiss, a big sloppy one, a snog even. And while I do that, we're on to the next book. Okay, shipped. It's about time we got onto the final book. Am I right? Maybe that's why I'm single. Hey. Hmm, much to think about. <laughs> this was the final book that I chose for this seven day challenge. And to be honest, you can quite clearly tell that I didn't know much about these books before buying them because I chose lots of books that are very, very similar. This is very similar to The Hating Game, except it's The Hating Game, the remix. It's The Hating Game on holiday. The premise is two people are competing for the same job promotion and they get sent to the Galapagos Islands. Not gonna lie guys, I wish that my job took me to the Galapagos Islands, but um, Good for them, I'm happy for them. These two have had so much beef over email that cows are jealous, but kind of in like a tense, sexy way. Um, the most dramatic thing in my email inbox is, as per my previous email, and so when they arrive on this dreamy island, they are expecting to despise each other, and spoiler alert, that's not what happens. Who is surprised? Certainly not me, because I've read so many similar books at this stage, but listen. I really enjoyed it. The writing style is fun and witty. There's loads of little metaphors and jokes. I think it would be the perfect book to read on a sun lounger, on holiday, on the beach. I read it during storm units, so the wind has just been absolutely pounding at the window. Um, some pounding goes on in this book, but in a very different way. Both the characters are good people, you're kind of rooting for them. And I also thought this was a bit more mature than The Hating Game, maybe. Was it the most unique thing I've ever read? No, but was it great escapism? Yeah, sure. Did it make me feel very lonely? Yes, as well. You know what, you choose looks, I choose books. So, how lame is that? So, I think the conclusion of this video is that my personal preference when it comes to the romance genre is when we have multifaceted, complex characters who have more going on than just the romance. And the romance basically just makes them an even better version of themselves. And elevates their experience, it improves the fulfilling life they already lead. I like a balance of the love story, but also their own personal stories and their friendships as well as the love. But crucially, that's just my perspective. If you want to pick up a romance book just for a steamy old time, you go for it, my friend, and enjoy it. We all pick up and read books for different reasons. That doesn't mean anyone is right or wrong or more intelligent and highbrow than anyone else. And if you have a really great time with a book, 
that makes it a good book. I don't care what anyone says, and it's been really interesting to dive into a genre that I wasn't that familiar with. So, Romance Books 1, Jack Nil. There's been a lot more action going on in these books than I have in my current life. Thank you so, so much for watching this video all the way through. If you enjoyed it, you can share the love by giving me a thumbs up and subscribing down below. I love ya, have a great day, all the best, stay in touch, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye